so welcome everyone um this is my first tech sessions of the year so the, the best one that you could have come on um probably going to be the best event of the year anywhere um but if you haven't been on for neil's webinars and sessions before really really good really informative you'll absolutely love it um, and for those of you who don't know me um so i'm sophie and i head up infrastructure network and support here at Corcom. Um, so throughout, if you do have any questions, me and Neil are happy to do, you know, discussions. Um, so if Neil does something and you want to ask more about it or whatever, um, either speak up or just put it in the chat and we'll we'll answer as we go along. Or if you have anything at the end, just add it on and we can um we can go from there. Happy to do that. Um, so it gives me great pleasure. I'll pass on to Neil and we'll we'll begin this session. Right. Uh, afternoon, everybody. I see a few names that I recognise here. Um, Luke, have you got nothing else better to do, mate? Uh, that's Luke down I don't there. know what you mean, mate. Yeah, I know. Um, so, yeah, welcome to this uh, webinar. It is please be interactive um, and shout out and up for discussion. This might be at a level where it's teaching granite to suck eggs, or it may be just for information or cementing some of the information that you already know. So, this is it's about cloud connectivity. So my background is 25 years of networking and security. Uh, I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Cloud Gateway that's been around for about five years now that we, we've built a network and security fabric, um, hybrid uh, network, one, network one at that. Uh, and we've come across millions of ways of, of helping people move to cloud, secure cloud. And we're also seeing, because cloud's not all it, um, makes out to be a lot of repatriation. So going from cloud, uh, actually back onto on-prem. So what I'm gonna to discuss today is just, that there's a million and one ways of how to do connectivity and security with the cloud, because there's so many tools out there, uh, so many different architectures, so many different use cases of what the actual end requirements are. I'm just gonna go through two or three um, from a, a technical level. So it'd be fairly technical and do some sort of pros and cons of, uh, of my approaches. Now, as I said, these are the just ones that the common ones that I see sort of on a day-to-day on -day basis. So please feel free. I might be wrong. Uh, you might not like what I say. You might have other ideas, but it's just about sharing information. So please, please, if you've come up with an idea of, hey, I've seen someone else do this in a different way. These are the benefits. Please shout out. This is an education piece. This is this is not a sales piece for Cloud Gateway. In fact, I'm not going to talk about Cloud Gateway um, at all, really. Um, so this is just aimed at sort of network and insecurity uh, people. So I'm going to share my screen. Boom, there we go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my LED lights off because that's hitting the frequency. So... For those of a certain age, you will understand and know about what and who Tony Hart is. So this is what we're going for here. So if you can all see this, I believe that you can. Sophie, can you see it? Nod. Yes. Right. Yeah, we can Lovely see job. it, yeah. Perfect. So three different scenarios of how we can connect your enterprise or an enterprise. It could be your house. Um, it could be um, a branch office. It could be an entire estate. Um, first one is, you'll well know this, is VPN, Virtual Private Network, and we'll talk a little bit about IPsec there. So this is this technology has been around forever and a day. Everybody knows a, a VPN. Everybody knows a VPN from a phone or a, a VPN client from your laptop. Uh, and a lot of people, it was primarily used for um, connecting sites together um, in a very, very secure way so that if everybody can sniff and tech packets and, and try and get a stream from that, all they would see is encrypted traffic. So let's take a dead easy example of how we can connect. And this is how I've done my house now. My house is currently connected to uh, Azure and AWS because I'm sad. So what we've got, you've got your building there. You've got a device. Most people now have got... Um, a router or a firewall or some of the decent, even consumer grade um, routers that you get with your broadband can do VPN type stuff like a VGOR or something. But let's pretend this is a medium sized business where they've got 50 people uh, and they want to start consuming stuff in cloud because cloud's hip and trendy. So they'll have a router there. 
they'll have a simple broadband connection or any sort of connection whatsoever to the internet, exactly the same way that you've got at home. You may have direct internet access, you may have 100 meg, you might have a gig. Either way, most businesses, I'd say 99% of businesses, have got an internet connection. Uh, and this allows people to go to the internet, eBay, get their emails, use Office 365 and things. But what we're finding now is that these have also got data centers where I'm not going to do the cloud pitch, where there's a lot of hardware and data centers and it's costing you a small fortune to run it. And when it gets to five years old, you've got to skip it and it doesn't scale. And, you know, it's the cloud thing. So I'm just going to use a cloud vendor. Obviously, there's hundreds out there. I'm just going to use AWS. So Amazon Web Services. It's the thing that um, everybody knows about. Quite a lot of services um, use it. So for example, I think Netflix and Slack definitely uses it and things like that. So these are massive data centers. It's a cloud service that's populated anywhere in the world. Now, in there, you want to you want to basically replicate your data center. You want to connect to your stuff. You want to start using your GUI, get your credit card out, and start spinning up tens of servers and services in AWS. Now, first thing we do in there is we create something called a VNet. Uh, actually, not that's in Azure, a VPC. All you're doing is you're creating your own little private network there. This isn't sort of known as IaaS. So infrastructure as service, you're using somebody else's data center to create a load of virtual machines. Now, if you've got stuff spun it up here and you want to connect it as if it's on-prem and connected to your data centers, we're going to use this VP, uh, VPN thing. So without any prior knowledge, AWS and all the cloud service providers that have got this wrapped up for you, you can basically spin something up called a virtual gateway or virtual private gateway and you can attach it to your VPC. And all it is, is a router and VPN termination endpoint that you can connect, buy off um, Amazon. It might cost you 25 pounds a month. And it basically presents out to the internet. So what we're gonna do now is change colors because I got some new cranes for Christmas. So that's all well and good. AWS is connected to the internet. Your house is connected to the internet. What we want to do is effectively spread and um, make it as if your the stuff that you're building in cloud is connected to your enterprise. Because you may want to move the services from there to there or back and forth, or you may be just want to, I don't want to expand in my data center, it's too expensive. I just want to go health for leather and building everything out with our cloud first principle. So VPN, you can create an IPsec VPN from your router here, AWS will give you a wizard. They will go, right, I want to connect to, this is a Cisco device. They will then spit out a config that you can download and you can cut and paste onto your router. And you know what's gonna happen is it is gonna create an encrypted tunnel of reasonably high level of encryption across the internet. And it's going to do all the BGP and things. So effectively, you're bringing your own router, using your own internet, spinning something up that takes literally 30 seconds to do. You're going to click, oh, I'm too lazy to do the configuration myself. Give me the config. It's going to cut and paste. And you're going to cut and paste it onto your router. Effectively, then, that network that you've created with all the servers in there is now securely connected and it attracts as if it's on-prem to your estate. So I'm a PC here. I've got a PC up here that's IP address .a. From here, if I type in ping, I know this might be 10.1.2.0.a, it will ping, it will go down the tunnel and on there. It's basically you've created an extension of your network in the cloud and you can leverage all the cloud. It just spins up and spins down. Now, pros and cons of doing this. There's loads. So some of the pros of doing this, it's cheap. You're not buying any new hardware. You've probably got something that can do it. Anything that can do IPsec will be able to do this. You brought your own internet circuit because you're sweating your asset, you're leveraging it. Spinning a VGW up in AWS might cost you 20, 25 pound a month and you're done. So it's dead, dead cheap. It's quick. 
from nothing, I can get this spun up and I can basically build my own world's biggest data center connected to my infrastructure in five minutes. It, it literally is, it takes that, um, that space of time. So it's quick and easy. This is really good if you just want to tinker and play about in the cloud. So say, for example, uh, in there, um, I've got all my CCTV storage. So what happens is on my CCTV around my house, it streams and uploads the data privately across the internet. I don't want people sneaky beaking in there to see what's going on with my eight cameras around my house. It's encrypted. Saying that, there are some disadvantages. There is no SLA. Because you're running across the internet, as you know, there is no service level agreements. If the internet is a little bit slow because everybody in your area is spanking the internet, you've got nobody to complain about. Um, another thing that happens quite a lot, and it gets mentioned a lot, and I want to have a tirade about it, is cloud providers love you to shove stuff into the cloud. But the minute that you want to start pulling data, that, 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 that meter is rolling. Every time you move data out of the cloud, there's a little thing called data egress charges. And I tell you what, it surprised a lot of people. Every time you move data out, it costs you nine cents per gig to get that data out. You know what? It costs you zero pence to go in that direction. They love you to shove all the cloud, all the stuff in the cloud. But the minute you want to start consuming service, and let's be frank about it, um, when you download something from the cloud, it's moving in that direction. These are the bills. So every time you connect a site, any data that you transfer across that VPN, because it's going across the internet, you're going to get stung for nine cents a gig. Then there's things on top is that if you're going to do it properly, you need to put certificates and change your keys because eventually you, you can get different levels of encryption and it'll take somebody longer. But in this day and age with quantum computing, if somebody really wanted to, now nobody's going to really bother about my CCT footage from my house. But if you're a financial institution and you're moving data around, if somebody, I don't know, the Ruskies decide to capture a load of data, it's all well and good now um, because you're encrypted. But soon what will be happening is they can crack that encryption with the way that quantum computer is running on and it's going to be a smaller and smaller time period before they can actually decrypt. Now, if it's data that's moving back and forth, that's fine. But what if it's healthcare data? So say, for example, I take this to the really extreme. Um, a private hospital that's, say, doing the royal family, um, moving data around the Russians or the Chinese, managed to get hold of some data. It's encrypted for the minute. There's nothing to stop them in 10 years' time that the compute power can take that data they've captured decrypt it at that point because technology's moved along. And they've got data about little Prince Jeff um, that he's got, he's allergic to peanuts. And they've managed to glean that and that person's still alive. So the, it's, it's all important about making sure that the keys change and the certificates change and you just, just don't put a VPN up and then walk away from it. However, for the vast majority of people, this is the quickest way to connect securely to cloud to make sure that it's uh, connected as if it's on-prem. That, that's stage one. People use this as a transitory stage to some of the other stuff that I'm going to then build on from. Scenario one. Any questions before we move on? Um, yes, but I'll leave it till later. Right, -o, no worries. What we're going to talk about now is um, cloud providers figured out that, hey, everything's built in cloud and everybody's connected to the internet, wit woo. But when you've got large volumes of data and you need an SLA, you need that data to get to the cloud securely and privately and very quickly. Cloud providers realized that they needed something other than just using the internet. They needed a little bit, something a little bit more robust that had an SLA. So what we're gonna talk about now is, you might have heard of direct connects and express routes. It achieves pretty much the same thing, except about it goes in a very, very different way. And there's some different pros and cons of doing this. So my enterprise here, this could be a data center and I've got lots of other sites connected across a WAN. We're gonna use the same across here. We're gonna go AWS. You know what? We're gonna go Azure as well. Big estate, 
we're deciding to go full AWS to spin up a new a new video platform to take on Netflix. I'm using Azure because I've got a 50,000 seat estate and I don't want my email, crappy little email servers on site. I want to go full 365 or start using Azure Active Directory or something. So I need something a little bit more robust than just using the internet. They've come up with, basically, it's creating a private circuit in the traditional way, as in a telco comes and delivers a circuit, like the, the broadband line, the, the, the line rental that you pay to broadband is a physical bit of fiber or bit of copper that leaves your house and it goes to the exchange and it goes to the internet in a roundabout way. What these are, these are effectively putting private circuits into your estate. So what happens is you've got a router on your site in your data center. In AWS, they will create something, um, it's called Direct Connect, abbreviated as DX. All it's doing is effectively replicating that virtual gateway. And what we're doing here is we go into a telco. I don't know, it could be BT, it could be Vodafone, it could be Colt. It could actually be Cloud Gateway because we've got the capability or Elite or somebody like that, where it's a private circuit. It's not going across the internet. Um, and effectively, you can go, right, I want big boy pipes. I want 10 gig because I'm really going to start smashing up and, and using AWS as my main fabric for everything. Um, in Azure land, exactly the same concept, except down here, I think it's called a, also called a VGW. It's called Express Route. And all it is is exactly the same way. You go to a telco provider, they will dig up a hole in the road and they will provide you a circuit. On the end of that circuit is your private AWS environment or your Azure environment. So again here, we've got a standard router, doesn't need to do encryption, that's one of the benefits we'll go through. And then they will connect into Azure that way. And again, on this one, I'm not doing as much. I want one gig circuit. Again, you can use all these telco providers. So what this is doing over the IPsec version is it's not putting extra strain on your internet circuit. It's got nothing to do with that. These are private dedicated circuits. So with that, it's dedicated, which means that there's, if you don't need it, there's no real reason to put encryption over the top of it. However, I worked for many government agencies uh, that, that we've done within Cloud Gateway uh, and even though it is private, you still want a level of, I still don't trust anybody end to end. Because this is basically, that's somebody else's network in the, in, the, in the middle that you're using. So it's dedicated. There's no reason for having IPsec and the overheads um, with that. You can do quality of service and SLA. So if this goes down or your expected latency between there, maybe you're a financial institution that's doing trading, that say, I've got an SLA that it needs to get there in 25 milliseconds. If that starts going through the roof, you can actually pick up the phone and start complaining. Why is this running like a dog? Why is it taking so long? Why is the jitter on there? You've got somebody to complain about. And because it's private, they can do something about it. You can also do quality of service that if you had say 10 gig, um, you could say real time business traffic gets prioritized over people watching cat videos. Simple stuff like that. You can't do that really across the internet. Uh, you can do it uh, uh, across there. Da, 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 da. Even though you're moving data in and out of the cloud, um, the good benefit of doing it this way is instead of it being nine cents a gig to pull data out, they're letting you off a little bit. It's actually only two cents a gigabyte. So your reduction in data egress charges is a, is a lot less. Now, there's uh, pros and cons with this is that the downsides, there's no doubt. At the end of the day, you're used to doing traditional telco stuff. It is going to cost you money. And depending on which these uh, boys and girls decide to provide you the circuits, they're going to charge you different pricing. And if you're in the middle of beyond like where I am now, they may charge you something called ex excessive excess construction costs or charges. Basically, I can get so far but I'm going to have to literally dig up the road, dig your garden up, move the chickens out, reroute that, move your garage. But we can do it, but it's going to cost you. You get those charges. 
along with that, because it's traditional telco, it means people actually have to come and dig up the roads and do stuff. So it takes time. The reason why um, I started Cloud Gateway is um, I was working for a very large government department um, where Telco was going to charge them £400,000 and take nine months to provision one of these circuits into a data centre that is so well known and so easy. We just thought there's got to be a better way of doing this. And that's the reason why we started Cloud Gateway. As it happens, we can uh, provision that and it costs us about a grand and takes about three minutes. So this is the reason why we started it. So cost and time prov pr to provision. Now, what we see nowadays is a lot of multi-cloud. So years ago, people jumped into bed when they went to cloud because it's a hip and trendy thing to do. You jumped into bed with Amazon or you jumped into bed with Microsoft. Um, and that's just the way the world was at the time. Now that all the cloud providers are vying for position in their specialist areas, you can have the best of breed um, across multiple providers. So say for example, Azure, they know that, that Microsoft have got it all wrapped up regarding Active Directory and end user compute, uh, like uh, Office and 365 and, and your email stuff. Whereas Amazon know that they're awesome uh, doing all the dev stuff because the devs love it because they've got the tool sets. So you can have the best of breed across that. Downside of doing this method is, oh, well, I've got stuff in Amazon, but it needs to speak to stuff in Azure or I want the same for Azure. So what you end up doing is for every single cloud provider that you may go with, I don't know, let's not leave Oracle out if you're a big Oracle house, you're going to have to provision one of these circuits and to make them diverse for every single cloud provider out there. If you're really going to go full balls out of moving everything to cloud, you're going to have to be able to do that. Now, what we're finding nowadays as well is you might have some end user and compute stuff in here that talks to AWS, some back end service. To get them to speak to each other, you're going to be back holding traffic this way. Yes, you can set up internet VPNs across that way, but we've discussed about what AWS um, VPNs can do. Yes, they're quick, they're cheap, there's no SLA, uh, you have to do encryption, there's a bit of a management overhead. So with these private circuits, um, you might hear them call um, basically layer two um, VP, um, VCs or virtual circuits. What you, they're doing is the telco sits in the middle and provisions you a VLAN end-to-end. -end. So if there's any network guys amongst us, it literally is a layer two end-to-end. -end. So your dot one and the other end is dot two. And then you run BGP across it and away you go. You can do what you want there. Benefits of doing this is that um, some of the benefits is it's all native. Bit of a double-edged sword with networking in the cloud is that we've come across stuff um, where there's going to be a certain individual on this call going to have a laugh is that because it's easy done clicky 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 on your little GUI with AWS and the cloud is that networking's dead easy. Click and provision it. It works. Mm. Um, and, and, and to some extent, it has made life easier, but it's also left massive gaping holes in design, how routing works, uh, networking is still a dark art and you still need to understand how networking works. It's a dangerous thing where you're giving DevOps the keys to the car um, for networking security, but that's a, a contentious thing. But being able to do these, the instructions, they're very clear and Amazon and AWS and Oracle and Google made it very, very easy for you to connect your infrastructure across these circuits. In reality, you don't really need a network person until it goes wrong and then it's like, oh, the network's broken. I don't know what to do. So that is a manual way of doing things. So that's across the internet, IPsec, dead easy, dirt, cheapy, but you get what you pay for. This private circuits, SLA, but not necessarily scalable from a cost because you're going to have to go and put everything into um, various clouds. The last one is effectively, um, I'll just call it layer two colo stroke cloud gateway. It's not a cloud gateway pitch, I promise you, um, but it's the underlying technologies and architecture that, that we use to do this. So what we're gonna do on this, we're back here, 
we've got your enterprise and it might have 200 sites on there. Um, what we're going to do is we've got some stuff in AWS. We've got some stuff in Azure. We've got some stuff um, in Google. And um, I want a secure web gateway service to protect me going to the web. What we can do is, this is what we've built. I'll just draw a cloud gateway in the middle, is we've got a security fabric in the middle um, that's got part uh, physical in data centers that you can lick and touch and feel. And then our platform is built across, um, abstracted and moved across private cloud, uh, public cloud. So what we can do here is we're completely agnostic of how you connect to us. So you know what? We get a lot of customers um, that, want to use IPSEC to start with, method one. Then what happens is they've got a, a BT WAN. And what we can do is within our data centers or any of the co-location places, so an example, Equinix, um, Global Switch, um, any of the sort of traditional co-location, so IMART, um, for Node 4, um, co-location -lo co places, is that we can connect across there with a simple NNI. So your infrastructure is connected to a fabric. What we can do from there, um, or if, you, if you're, you've got your data center is in our data center, it's just a simple data center cross connect. And I mean, just literally throw a cable across the hall. Now, in the middle here, the certain technology that we can use is we can connect it to AWS uh, and instead of it taking 90 days and 400 grand, you can provision this instantly. It takes less than five minutes and you can go from 50 meg up to 10 gig plus and we can provision that. You know what? You decide to do something in Azure, plug and play, five minutes, Google, five minutes, and you can connect on there. You decide that instead of your all your proxies and your firewalls and your IPS and your IDS that's currently connected to the internet, you want to migrate it and get rid of it to, to come to the end of its life, is that you can very quickly, easy, spin up all those services centrally so everything goes in and out of the internet through a central place. And spinning this up, you don't have to worry about scalability because you start small. If it gets hot, it builds out wider and wider. Benefits of doing this way is, well, it's instant, it's agile. You need that connectivity, you can do this. If you were in, say for example, obviously I've just Cloud Gateway in there, but if you were in, say for example, any of the major data centers, you can have this connectivity to the cloud with the private stuff. So that's a direct connect, that's an express route, that's a, I think it's a fast connect there. If you're, say for example, in Equinix, go and take a look at their ECX product. If you're in some of the other data centers, go and look at Megaport or Epsilon or all these guys, what they can do, they will literally run a cable to your rack and go, there you go, plug it into your estate. Over the top of that, we'll give you a little pretty portal that they can, where you can click um, AWS, Azure, my VPC and my VNet. Um, I want to attach it. And what will happen is down that cable, there'll be a VLAN number. And at the end of that, is all these stuff and it all, it all is instant. You've got all the connectivity. One of the other benefits of doing this is, well, the agility and it costs, it, it's pennies. You can run this direct connect for a week and then turn it off. And you know what? It costs you zero pence thereafter. You're not having to tie to your traditional telcos where it's you've got to commit for a three year circuit. None of that. If you've got it wrong and you put a 50 meg circuit in and go, uh, I now need 100 meg because I've misaligned this. You know what? Go onto the portal, 100 meg, press. Five minutes later, you're increased. It's also allowing you to do your multi-cloud. You can do all this and back on there and all these different directions. And basically, you've created an overlay network in seconds. Downsides, yes. You have to be, it's going to be a, a managed service or you're going to have to go into a colo. Um, Benefit still that it's all it's all dedicated, so you have to get to um, th those points. Now, I've mentioned security. Uh, sorry, mentioned connectivity all over this. We've got to bear in mind security. Is that 
we look at this architecture and we do it across multiple clients. In fact, um, one of the very big clients that we've got currently on this call, we do it this for them. So I mentioned secure web gateway services. This becomes your ingress and egress point out to the internet. What you can do is instead of having internet gateways everywhere there and you have no idea of what's coming into your environment, if you let something in the front door there, that is effectively on the inside of your environment at that point. We do an architecture called, um, it's a walled garden approach. So DevOps through compliance or anybody else are not allowed to put internet gateways into any of these sites. What you effectively do is you're routing down those pipes and you go out of a central point so that you've got the corporate governance and the security in the middle there. So these people out here, if I'm down here and I want to go on eBay, it's going through there. I get full security and visibility. So what you're effectively doing is you're consolidating all the security services into a, a more scalable model, flexible model, turn it on, turn it off, kill it, plug and play, from a networking perspective, uh, uh, and away you go. Now, security-wise, inside the cloud. Up until recently, um, the security is not good at all in the cloud, um, out the box. So, for example, if you do network, or oh, my first VM in Azure, you spin up a VM, it's a Windows box, um, I was stunned to find that that box left RDP open directly to the internet. From a security perspective, um, I was like, you've, you've, that cannot be the default way of doing things. That is insane. And it's true. And it still stands. Uh, we, but there's other, there's, there's other sort of mitigations on that. Between stuff, you've probably heard of... Uh, network security groups or security groups, that is effectively on every single VM, there's a tiny firewall that wraps around the, the actual instance itself and VM. These only run at layer three, layer four. They're, layer three, layer four. They're effectively um, packet filters. So uh, you're stopping uh, servers from speaking to each other or service it or people speaking to those servers that are not meant to be there. It is not, it is absolutely not a secure or wholly secure way of doing thing. We call it, excuse the French, it's a shit catcher. It blocks the vast majority of stuff. Is it secure? No. Does it stop any threats when you do pen tests, authenticated scans? Absolutely not. Now, up until recently, the cloud providers didn't provide any of those and you had to use something called uh, NVAs. And effectively, um, what you had to do is you had your servers there and um, you had to, and you had your virtual gateway there and it was connected off to the rest of your estate. You had to effectively insert your own firewall or unified threat management device in the way, in a traditional way. You were simulating a, a traditional network in, in there because these little security groups here only run at layer three, layer four. UTMs can run at full layer seven so that they can de decrypt the packet. I've, I've got a big rant and there's videos online about me going about it, but if you can't see what's going inside the packet, you've not got a great deal of protection. Now, saying that, to be fair to, I can't believe I'm saying it as you're more than anyone of recent times, they're allowing you and coming up with better than just layer three, layer four firewall, and which is ultimately useless. They're allowing you to slot natively, so you don't need to be a network god or goddess, to run some of the stuff that layer three, lay, uh, above layer three, four, like application control, deep packet inspection, TLS intercept, uh, antivirus and anti-malware, because antivirus and anti-malware, if it's encrypted, it's absolutely pointless. They're allowing you to do that nowadays, and they're getting there. Is it perfect? No. Do you need a network and security guy or gal? Probably. That's a very recent thing. Amazon are not very good at it, to be honest. So you had to put some of the things in place. Um, it will, over time, merge that you will get that level of security, a dedicated appliance in the fabric. But for the minute, it's not there. So lastly, let's talk about why it's important to have 
appliances or devices or things on your network, whether it's on cloud or between clouds, to do deep packet inspection. More and more, um, everything is transported in a, a TLS wrapper. So when you go to your website, uh, when you go to your bank, your direct, uh, first direct, you've got a little padlock, HTTPS, it's encrypted end to end. Um, it's easier now to just wrap everything in a, in a TLS wrapper. So APIs uh, and uh, uh, emails and various things like that normally get wrapped up in TLS. Downside of that, because it's encrypted, these boxes can't see inside the payload. So you might have an absolutely virus-ridden email um, or virus-ridden packet or something going on, but because it's encrypted, you can't see inside it. And you think that your UTM's doing it uh, and protecting you. It's not. So the reason why we do a lot of stuff within Cloud Gateway is TLS intercept or deep packet inspection is effectively what happens is a packet comes from server A, it's going to server B. If it's encrypted end to end, and I put my little spying glass on there, I can't see it, it's encrypted, the payload. What's happening inside there, I don't get visibility. The reason why you need to do layer seven and deep packet inspection and certificate inspection is what we can do is we can intercept that packet here. We unencrypt it, we open the padlock, that's my version of an undone padlock. It goes through the inspection. We can then see inside the payload, is it virus ridden? Is it, has it got some sort of exploit in there that's trying to break and do a DDoS attack or do something stupid on that? We can then stop it at that point. So your firewall and your unified threat management device is doing its job. Then once it's gone through that, it re-encrypts it. And you know what? The end device doesn't know anything has ever happened. So this part here, it might be called deep packet inspection, um, TLS intercept, um, SSL inspection. What it's doing is intercepting. It's also called, it's a hacking technique called man in the middle. Effectively, you're getting the, the, the traffic, de-encrypting it, re-encrypting it and sending it on. Um, downsides of doing this is um, these devices they do need a lot of compute power because of all the maths that they're doing. So that was just one last thing is don't rely on cloud security, just network security groups. And even if you think you're doing one better by slamming in the most greatest Palo Alto because it's the hip and trendy thing this month, if you're not doing deep packet inspection, it's not doing a great deal. Um, so that's the important. Don't be, um, don't be sold into thinking that sticking a firewall in there is going to solve all your security worries. It's not, you need to be able to do that properly. So on that note, thank you for listening. Quick overrun, IPSEC, cross the internet, sweat your asset, VPN, bit of a pain in the backside, maintaining the security over the top, but it's quick and easy and you can have a good play that. You could go this afternoon on AWS, spend 30 quid a month and you could extend, you could have your own data center in the cloud from your house if you're a loser like me. Expensive way but it's private, end-to-end, -end, private circuits from your enterprise to all the clouds. But the downside is you've got to do it every single cloud that you want. Dedicated, no reason for IPSEC, you get an SLA, but it's gonna cost you a fortune and take you forever and a day. And there's not much flexibility once I've dug up the road. Last one, uh, a layer three colo or a cloud gateway network fabric where you can connect in any method you want, makes no difference, but you can connect to all the cloud providers instantly really quickly, agilely, spin up, spin down, only pay for what you use, uh, and you can use secure web gateway services to, to do all the security to make sure it's inbound and outbound. Lastly, don't be fooled in thinking sticking a firewall in there is going to keep the security guys happy. It's not. You need to know what you're doing. Layer three, layer four, and native networking security in any cloud provider is effectively crap. You need to do something a little bit uh, above and beyond. Go and research the reason why deep packet inspection, S TLS intercept or SSL inspection is vital to actually find out what is going inside it. Think of it like a Trojan horse. The, the horse gets through the gate if you don't encrypt it. They, they could be like the soldiers inside it. If you can get the to the gate, open up that Trojan horse, find out what's going on. Ah, load of soldiers in there. No, you're not coming in. It gets dropped at that point. That's the analogy for deep packet inspection. 
Any questions? Uh, okay. You had one. I did have one, yes. Um, it was the initial page. Hi. Um, I worked for a, a company which was dealing with local government, well, not local government, but national government. Yep. And we had um, Azure. Hmm? And then we, I decided to put another Azure site in place. Yep. Purely and simply because we didn't have the reliability. Yep. In terms of... Um, the first one was going down every now and again. So what I wanted to do was to put another one in. Uh, is that a good idea? Uh, another uh, what? Another VPN or another uh, AWS? Uh, sorry, Azure Cloud. Another Azure Cloud. Um, so we'd end, end up with basically two. Um, there's no reason to do that if you do the um, architectural best principles. So say, for example, is if you're seeing stuff go down, I would probably point to the application guys and go, what's going on here? So yeah, we, 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 did, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> in that case, someone needs a slap. So for example, in Azure, there's no excuse for it now. And this is the same across all cloud providers. Archi the CPU I, I, I don't think it was down to the providers. I think it was down to the um, telecoms. Um, well, in Azure, the SLA, to get an SLA from for the Azure um, Express route, so if you've got a, a, say, for example, your data center, you've gone to, I don't know, I'm picking so, up. So basically what we had was a data center. Yeah. We had some on-prem stuff. Yeah. And then we had another data center. Yeah. So basically what was replicated between the two data centers yeah. was coming back to us. That makes any sense. The replication is coming back to you. Yeah. So basically, basically, what you've got there is the the big cloud. Yeah. Is us. Yeah. So the data center one and data center two. Yeah. Would be coming back to us, but it would be our information would be replicated straight back. Yeah. So across these <laughs> links. Yes. Yeah. So you're doing data replication across there. Um, yeah. If it's across two different data centers, the proper architect to do it properly, to even get an SLA from Microsoft, they won't allow you to do it now. If you've got an express route, you need to have um, two physical circuits leaving your environment. Um, because of that reason is that if you put one circuit in and it gets a little bit nasty and, and crap or it keep, the telco keeps failing, um, they Microsoft will won't do anything about it because you need to have two for that exact reason is because in the early days when I was at the Ministry of Justice, I, I bought one express route and they you, just went... You just let yourself go there. You said where you were. <laughs> but yeah, I'm very proud to work there. It's a brilliant project. Um, um, that we did one express route and Microsoft went, well, what happens if that dies? I'm like, well, it shouldn't die. It's telco in this day and age. And they just went, no, having none of it. So we have to do two for that exact reason. And it was two from a physical location. So to get that resiliency, and that's why now when you go in, into Azure and, and, and click an express route to build it, it gives you two BGP peers to set up, a primary VLAN and a secondary yeah. VLAN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It forces you. Um, if you don't do that, I think it lets you do it, but goes no SLA. So basically- No, 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 no. We, we went down the, the two route. Yeah. Uh, in theory, um, the telco should be doing that. However, as a backup, because I'm only retentive, if I was, let's go this other way around. I've got the cloud over here. That's Azure. I've got my two express routes that effectively doing that, and that's one combined. Um, what you can do, and they're saying this with the architecture nowadays as well, is, you know, I talked about the IPSEC before. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah is have that as a backup. And if you make sure that all your BGP is done there, um, everything will fail over. So if that dies, it should fail over to that. If the network provider in the middle, which it shouldn't, and if it does, I will get rid of my telco. If something dies in the middle there and all bets are off, 
at least you've got that back up to be able to go there. You can layer these on top, but the overhead of that is your network guy or gal needs to be a pretty good with their BGP on that because you can have routing loops and all sorts of hell, and I've seen it. And yeah, I've got 25 years experience. It does make you scratch your head. I mean, I've, I've done BGP before, um, and it's uh, I'm pretty much up to snuff on it. Yeah, I think it was it was down to the telcos because the the lines went down. That's two. You, you shouldn't have two go down. No, no, we had one go down. That's why I wanted the second one put in. Yeah, uh, that by far um, is the is the best way to do it. Having two circuits in there, and if you can do something, I think BT call it option two or option B, where they can prove that last mile to your building is uh, it goes to separate pops and it goes down different yeah. egresses. Exactly. Uh, people overlook that and don't take that option, um, but they realise what is the point if the pop goes down and you've got all your circuits going into it, it doesn't matter how many circuits you've got at the back end, it's going to die. So that's why we always make sure that you've got different egresses from your buildings for all of these anyway. I used to take a walk up the road and find out where it's gone down, but, just to make sure nobody's dug the road up or something like that. That, that is, uh, I worked for a large insurance company uh, in the centre of London, and we used to do that. It was just like, who's digging the road up now? Uh, yeah. That's why we then, now the good thing is that you can get 4G and 5G, and you can have different egresses, and, and it's like backup. It's not ideal, but you know what? It stops people moaning at you that they can't get access to their emails. Yeah, and I used to take photographs. And <laughs> yeah. So we've got no bloody excuse now. No, no. Oh, where have we gone? There we go. And oh, any other questions about any of the scenarios or just the net cloud networking in general? It's, it is a dark art. If, uh, I've got 25 years of network experience, but only really understood cloud networking uh, in the last five because there's no layer two. So if you know what I'm about, there's no layer two in cloud. I've spent four and a half years at Cloud Gateway trying to overcome that. Um, in the cloud and we've got some weird and wonderful techniques so if you're struggling with resiliency or load balancing or networking in the cloud just hook me up I'm more than happy to do a, a whiteboard session because it is a dark art and people like me are a dying breed um, because all the all the youngsters that come up through the ranks are not interested in networking now because it's dead easy you've got a GUI to click uh, oh, yeah. and, and, and <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Everybody's good at the shiny stuff that's uh, very quick and easy and you get instant gratification. People like me uh, are, are dying, but um, in 20 years' time, they'll be digging me out of retirement when, the, when their GUI stops working. So I know that I'm all right, Jack. Yeah. Um, yeah, if, um, if anyone does have any more questions, either, you know, you can email me, email Neil. Neil, do you want to pop your email in the chat? Um, around you know network cloud anything like neil says he's got over 25 years experience so yeah if you, you do want anything answer him you can just yeah Neil's put his email there or just message me um I do does have anyone have question. yeah of course chris yeah go for it um elon musk's um skylink starlink whatever he's calling it these days yeah i got um, an email the other day asking if i want to pay 89 pound a month for it no uh, yeah, it's coming out for beef in the uk now yeah quite interesting um just wondering what your thoughts are on using it as a backup link or uh, any useful sort of um things for um connecting out remote offices like this uh remote offices uh we were doing uh, a lot with um 4g and 5g at the end of the day whether people like it or not um the uk is a tiny island the north atlantic that's got fantastic comms um 4g coverage 5g coverage it's it, it all a commodity now Using satellite stuff, I've only ever had to do that with um, far away dusty places that you really can't get to. Um, but in the UK and in Europe, I don't see a real use for it. Um, if the infrastructure, the back end, say for, for, uh, for 5G, is able to cope with the mass, vast amounts of, of data, we do boxes now. And this is part of the SD1. Where is it? Uh, it's over there, um, where we can provide Ethernet circuits with 5G backup or 4G backup, and it's seamless the way it rolls over. And because 4G and 5G are getting so better, so back to Dave's issue of the circuit goes down, with SD1 performance monitoring and latency, you might find nowadays that 4G or 5G um, would be the preferred method for connectivity because it's a lot 
stable. Uh, there's more bandwidth there. Uh, and it may get to the point, and we're doing some with some emergency services where they're just putting two SIM cards in and two two circuits so they've got resilience and they're trusting that with quite critical blue light stuff. Uh, and we're seeing more and more of it. Um, I think Elon's with his satellites. Um, it may be for military purposes, but I don't think any in the civilian methods, unless there's some corporate that's got some stupid mega high bandwidth requirement. Um, but at the end of the day, Bill Gates says that 640k is enough for everyone. So, <laughs> but in the UK, 4G and 5G is going to be more than adequate. And I can see UT losing circuits to 4G 5G. Okay, cool. Uh, right, perfect. Um, so yeah, like I said, if anyone has any more questions, email me or Neil, happy to pass it on. Um, thank you again for coming. Thank you to Neil for doing that um, session. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. And like always, feedback is always, um, you know, helpful. So yeah, any, any feedback. And if you have got LinkedIn, if you can bob it on LinkedIn as well, that you've been and enjoyed it, that's massively helpful as well. Um, but no, we'll, we'll bring this to an end and a lot of people just saying really appreciate it and thank you, Neil. So yeah, no problem. Again. And it's not it's not a cloud gateway sale or anything. If anyone just wants workshops about networking and throw ideas, or if you're uh, looking out to go and do networking and cloud, use me as a sounding board because what I hate is seeing people being shafted or lied to by their suppliers, incumbents that they're doing some. Use me as a sounding board. More than happy. Got all the time in the world for that. So I'm just. Use, use me and abuse me it's not a problem perfect all right then well have a good rest of your afternoon evening everyone and hopefully see you on on the next test on the next tech sessions thank you cheers, Sophie. Oh, thanks very much indeed. Yeah, thank you.